in your life. Say something. Tell me something good. What has happened? Share with the team. Yeah, too good. Go, Marcus. Uh, one of the personal good. I kicked the. Uh, I played golf this weekend and I won. Yeah, yeah, yeah I won. <laughs> yeah. So I'll take that. Give him, give him that ball. Give him that yeah. ball. But yeah, because we're in we're in the same group. Yeah. And there's trust me, there's about 45, 50, and, and Marcus came in what second? Yep. Yeah, that that was huge. That was yep. huge. I'm not gonna say where I was at, but <laughs> came in second. Uh on a business tip, uh two past clients called me back this week to sell their uh, investment property. So yes, uh, get two listings going live in the next couple of days. So stay uh, stay in relationship. So stay in relationship. I, it's funny, we were together when you got that one call yep. where the, the, the person had gave um, open door, open door. one of them a look, yep. and it just it's just not right. Stay in relationship, guys. Stay yep. in relationship. All right, Rob. Mine was that same meeting. We just <laughs> discussed it. It was great to get out and fellowship and see everybody supporting um, the, the baseball team. Yep, we played at the charity golf event, so it was pretty fun. A lot of people came to support the kids. It was a good time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? Anybody on Zoom? Uh, since you mentioned me, oh, I guess because I unmuted myself. <laughs> um, wow. Hey, everybody. Uh, hey, wish I was right. in the room. Um, just excited. Have a couple of listings coming available. I put it in Team Tucker. I heard. Terrell's voice say, you know, that's what the group is for. That's what the Facebook group is for. So uh, the information is out there. They haven't been signed as of yet. However, they've confirmed that they will list with me. So if you know of anybody that's looking in the Snellville and the Cascade area, and I've already put the price range in there, feel free to inbox me so that I can have you on lock in, in terms of uh, presentation and giving you unofficial pictures and stuff like that to present to your clients. Already awesome, did. awesome, awesome. I think I, I think I heard somebody in the room say they've already hit you up. So um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. That's what our group is for, guys. We got to find ways to do those type of things. If no one else has anything, I'm going to move forward because uh, we have a lot to cover today. But before I um, before I get into something that I want to share with you guys, a book that I cracked open this weekend, I want to um, talk to talk to our um, matter of fact. I want to talk about who we have in this month. Every week, I've been super excited for you guys to, to um, give us names and introduce people to our family, and we have grown. Um, I want to go on record to say this is a record-breaking growth month for KW Perimeter East, so give it up for that. We uh, should be celebrating next month once mm -hmm. all the numbers are in. Uh, um, however, I want to welcome Shanika, Michelle Durham, Jamara, George, Tori and Green, Charlene Smith, um, Sean Davis, Daniel Furman, Tanya Best, Laureen um, Hartrig, um, Jaquan Kyles, Kelly Rose, uh, Nina Butler, Shawanda Williams, Katrina Richie, Dominique Gil Gamillion. Um, Kennedy Walker III, Abdul Rahim Holiday, Tyree Thorpe, Edna, Edna Tillis, and help me, Kennedy. Santisha. Santisha Wilson. So, welcome. Guys, we are at 24, 24 in. So, we're going to talk more about that next one. So, let's roll to the next. Um, Carlton, you got something real quick. We want to always thank you, man. Um, for for um, supporting us and sharing with us our O'Kelly and Sorehand partner. Anything burning that you just must share today? Hey, Terrell, good morning. Good morning. Uh, happy, happy end of the month. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be real quick. Um, so we, we get a lot of questions on uh, receiving earnest money. So there's uh, three different ways we can do it. Um, we, if, we're, if we're the holder, so we can all, we can always take a, a, a check from the um, from the buyer. Or there's the other, there's another option. If you go to our website, there's a link at the top of the page to send earnest money, and you just kind of follow the prompt, and um, that's an ACH transfer. So it takes a couple of days for it to go through and clear. But um, that's one other option. And then the third option is to do a wire transfer, and we will um, send wire instructions if they want to do that, or they can pick it up at our office. 
But um, I just uh, got a, a bunch of questions on that recently, and I just wanted to point that out there. We're, we're pretty flexible. But um, appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. No, no, thank you, man. We appreciate you, all your support. Thank you. Um, D. Sharina, do you have something really quick? Yep, just real quick, I just wanted to remind everyone to utilize our TBD underwrite to help you get your offers accepted and get commitment letters with your offers. Um, those are definitely faring out to be stronger than the pre-qualification letter and getting buyers in a position to close quickly. We just closed one in 14 days, actually two sisters in 14 days um, for Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. And um, we got the clear to close in two weeks because they had done everything up front. We already had them, you know, basically underwritten by the time their contracts were written. So um, I don't know if it helped Brenda win the offer, but I, I know it's helped us get them done on time and keep our commitment to the seller. So keep utilizing that, that process that we have in place, if you would. Um, and it also helps us if, if the appraisals take a long time, everything else is kind of done and all we're waiting on is the appraisal. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now um, that, that class is coming up. We're going to skip through that. We'll send it out. You got t-shirts. We're going to make sure that you get on that. We'll, we'll send the link out. Checks are due. Checks are due. By 10 yes. Casey said checks due by 10 a.m. tomorrow. If you had a closing, let us know. Even if you got paid at the table, let us know. Um, good Friday. Staff is out of the office um, on Good Friday. And um, speaking of, hope you guys have a, a great Easter. Um, so this is a book that um, my coach recommended to me, and I cracked it open this weekend. And, and I'm like that person who, you know, who, who got saved and went to church for the very first time. And now I want to come out and I want to save the world. And I barely know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, that's going to be this. That's going to be me today. Because it, it touched me, and I want to touch you with this, especially coming out of 2020. And I thought about the market that we're in right now. People are in, and you know, can, can find themselves in a rut and don't really need to be. So I just want to go into it. The book is called Chase the Lion. The author is Mark Batterson, and um, it, it is amazing. Some amazing stories in this book. So um, Chase the Lions. If you find yourself in a pit with a lion on a snowy day, you've got a problem. Probably, probably the last problem you'll ever have. Um, but you've got to admit, um, I killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Looks awfully impressive um, on your resume, right? Um, especially if you're applying for a bodyguard position with the king of Israel. Well, Benaiah not only landed his dream job as a king as, as King David's bodyguard, but his life exceeded his wildest dreams. Benaiah climbed the military chain of command all the way to the top, becoming commander in chief of Israel's army. The lion chaser became the most powerful person in the kingdom of Israel, save the king. But the genealogy of his dream traces back to a fight or flight mo moment. One decision turned his, um, determined his destiny. And not much has changed in the three million, um, three millennials since then. You can run away from what you are afraid of, but you will be running the rest of your life. It's time to face your fears, take a flying leap of faith, and chase the lion. That's just a little piece. Dude, I can go on and on. Like, <laughs> he told a story in there about this probably what hook, line, and sinker, because you guys know I'm good for reading about 20 pages in a book and then it's done. I've been in this book all weekend. I've been, Marcus, I was joking to say what place I came in. Marcus, did I come Saturday? Exactly. I didn't even, dude, I found myself reading and I missed my time to actually leave. I would have been late to the tea time. Seriously, it, it, I caught myself reading five pages that Saturday morning, and before I knew it, I looked up, I was 15 minutes past the time that I should have left to go to the, to, the, to the tournament. Seriously, this is a great book for the times that we're in right now with you guys, with the properties, the buyers that you're, you're filling up, and, and it's all mindset. 
and this is a huge, this is a great book. It, you know, it, it has some spiritual meaning behind it because the author is like a pastor or something, or, you know, he speaks on, 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 on the Bible a lot. He's a John Maxwell guy, um, but it's an amazing book, as you guys just heard. So chase that lion, man. Chase that lion, or you can live in fear. All right. So um, with that being said, hope that got you going, got your juices going. Hope you're woke because Jason's going to share a lot of charts and graphs, um, but they're going to help you. They're going to be tools. They're going to be tools that will help you battle that lion in that snowy pit. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up OPG here, one of the Latter Partners Property Groups. Jason! Oh, my bad, Jake. Did I, did I, you think they're going to log off? No, they like, people like charts and graphs, man. Some people like charts and graphs. I have a, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed when I'm doing charts and graphs and people show up because they heard that I was doing charts and graphs <laughs> instead of it got sprung on you when you're in the room and you're like, Oh man, there's only a few people in here. How do I slip out? <laughs> so I got you, and you're stuck for at least a little while. Um, I'll tell you, there's a. Uh, uh, I had almost one of my life's most embarrassing moments the other day. I was in front of a room, and I, I love being in front of a room right now. You know when when you don't get that for a long time. And and you we have like the isolation that's that, that we've had on a, a lot of fronts, you know. And then you get back in front of people live, and just, they're just oh, there's just energy that you can't you can't recreate in Zoom. And I understand all of it, and I know we got a lot of folks participating on Zoom. And I encourage you to find those opportunities to be live and in person, and you know, like hear somebody's voice in the room see their whole body emotions and, and, and interact. So I just, I love it. I love it. But so I'm in the room, there's like 50 top producers in the room and, uh, and I'm, and I'm leading this meeting. I mean, we're having great discussion and, and, and I'm going to be kind of pegged right here because I've got a camera there that I need to stick to, but I, I go back and forth. I pace, I go up and down. I've got to move. So I'm moving all around this day. And, and not tethered by anything. And then meetings over is great. Everybody shares wonderful. I got home and when I got home, uh, I went to change into some shorts. I'm the real personal here with you for a minute. So forgive me, <laughs> this, but, like, but I mean, it was, it's worth sharing because literally it was one of almost life's most embarrassing moments. So I go to change into some shorts to go work in the yard. And you know, uh, you know when you do clothes and laundry and an uh, article of clothing gets stuck in another article of clothing? Oh, yeah. Well, in my pants, I had been walking all around in front of this room and up and down. All the way at the bottom of my pant leg was a pair of my underwear <laughs> <laughs> that had gotten stuck in the laundry. It was, it was, it was clean, man. Don't look at me that way. It was clean. <laughs> But so all the way down in the bottom, almost at the bottom of my pant leg was a pair of my underwear. And I said, what <laughs> would have happened if I walked around in front of this, you know, and somebody said, hey, Jason, you got a, uh, uh, what is that? And, uh, uh, you know, and then it hit me. What if in the laundry, it was Nikki's underwear that got stuck in my pants? <laughs> And would have come out in front of this room, and then there would have been stories about me that you would not have. So uh, I say all that to tell you, I've thoroughly inspected my pant legs, and nothing's going to come out of the bottom of these while I'm up here walking around. But so I do have charts and graphs. Here's the deal: we've got to be the economist of choice. You know uh, my opinion on this. You know Gary's opinion on this. Uh, you are in a very, very complex industry. You handle transactions that are by, by most, in most situations, the largest financial asset and transaction that most people deal with in their lives. And you're in charge of it. So you don't get a pass on, on being the economist of choice. You just don't. And I'm telling you that 100%, you don't get a pass at that. You've got to do this. Even if, if it's not, doesn't come easy or naturally, or you're you're just naturally weird like I am and intrigued by these numbers and you want to study them, 
you don't get a PECS. You've got to be the economist of choice to be able to uh, decipher what's going on and then be able to put what's going on into uh, layman's terms to your client so that you can give them the information they need so that they can make an informed decision about their real estate needs. And then when you do that, you own that place in their mind as the real estate agent that they want to do business with. So we're going to hit it. Uh, and there's a lot. Look, folks, there's a lot. If you want to dig into something, you just, hey, I got a question about that. And we'll stop. If I ask a question, all I ask is that you answer. Because I have already I say this, you know, like, hey, I'm a high eye personality. If I'm up here and you're looking at me and I, I ask a question and you just give me that, that look. And I'm going to get my feelings hurt. I'm going to think I'm not giving you good stuff. So, so just do me a favor. And uh, if I ask a question, then let's, let's roll with it. So, all right, here's the deal. Here's 2020. 2020 started out really strange. Uh, you know, we had, we had a high first couple of months, and then all of a sudden the world shut down, and we thought we might be falling off a cliff. We had no idea. We'd never been in a situation before. And then when all of a sudden at Georgia, I was so thankful to be in Georgia where we were uh, classified as essential and able to safely still do business. Very, very, very important uh, that, that the government in Georgia was uh, allowed us to continue to be um, essential personnel and do business safely. That equated to a very healthy real estate market, healthy economy in Georgia, and many, many agents who were able to, and then were, and then chose to safely participate in the opportunities of 2020 had their best year ever. And so 2020 across the board, if you were able to, and chose to, uh, to participate best year ever. Then 2021 happens. We go into 2021 thinking, all right, we're just coming off of one of the best years ever. Things are beginning to uh, improve on these unforeseen things that we ran into. And, and, and so it's going to be great. But the challenge is, as you all know very, very clearly, um, inventory just completely devoured and not being replaced at the pace that it's being absorbed. And that is causing all of this frustration where when you're in an, an environment where every buyer that you're representing, you're making an offer in your competition with 20 plus other offers. That will make you want to pull your hair out. It's a challenging, challenging time. And so um, we've got to figure out, number one, what's going on in this market? What's going to happen in 2021? What can we see in 2022? How do we take advantage of the opportunities in the market? What do we, how do we tell our clients what they need to know? And then there's some other questions in here we'll talk about, which is many people right now are kind of thinking it feels a little crashy, like uh, 20, uh, like 2000, uh, 2007, 8, 9, it feels like, are we on a bubble? I mean, haven't anybody been asked the question, are we, are we almost going to crash? Is this like a bubble? Yes. Are yes. we? Yes. yes. So, so my goal today is this. I want to be able to give you information so that you can have good layman's terms conversations with people in that you come in contact with. I want to be able to give you a few sound bites that are very important things that, 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 point to the fact that this is not a bubble. It is not a crashy environment. We're not on this, you know, we're not driving down a road full speed and, and we just blew through a sign that said bridge out, okay? And we're just like, we're barreling down to our demise. That, that's not what's going on. And I'm gonna show you the reason why that's not what's going on. Um, and then give you some information on how you can, you know, what, how you can take advantage of the opportunity. So that's what happened in 2021. That's where we are. Uh, this is Lawrence Yuen, who is the chief economist for the, the National Association of Realtors, says that if we had more inventory, we would be on an 8 million unit pace. Let me put that in perspective for you. Last year, we did about like high 5 million, 5.9, something like that. Um, the, the, highest, the highest we've seen is around 7.2 7, uh, 7 million uh, annual transactions. And, and the headwind that we face in today's market is supply, is inventory. And so uh, the chief economist for NAR says, if we didn't have the headwind of supply, we would be on an 8 million unit pace. That is the type of demand that's in your marketplace right now. And I know we all feel it. Because you guys know that I, 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 
my wife and I, we run a team just like we're in the business, just like you are. I'm, we're, we're, we're knocking on doors and making phone calls and dealing with buyers and sellers and everything, just like you. I'm not, I'm not coming from to, to you from a position of, you know, uh, back in 1985, oh. you know, we had real estate books and it was hard, you know, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm shoulder to shoulder with you in the trenches. And this is what's going on. I, I, so, so that, that's the deal is, is we've, we've got this 8 million, 8 million unit pace is a huge number. And we have all of this demand and very, very little supply. You can see here 1.9 months supply of inventory uh, nationally. I can tell you that's not your local number. And we'll go over that in, in just a minute. Uh, mortgage rates, you see that the interest rates went down to well below 3% for 30 year money, which is ridiculous. Yeah. That's just ridiculous. Okay, um, that is an unsustainable number, and it had to go back up. It has gone back up to, it went over three. <laughs> so it, like long-term 30-year money, it went over three. It's still free, by the way, at 3%, that's still free. That's like free money. So that is just an insane number. Predictions are, they're, they're, they're predicted to continue to be low. Um, so while we've had the pop in interest rate, and hopefully that creates some sense of urgency, the, the challenge is when you have an undersupply and an over demand, um, a sense of urgency in the buyer is not really what we're looking for. Okay, we're looking for a sense of urgency on why the seller should put their house on the market. And when we're in an environment like we've been in the last year where, uh, where it's, it's like, hey, if I put my house on the market, I might die. Well, that's a pretty strong headwind for, for inventory to say, well, if I have strangers walking through my home and they're infected with a pandemic disease, then I might die. So that created a lot of situations where people took their, didn't put their homes on the market. Financial uncertainty, uh, insecurity around what's going to happen in their world with like all of those things caused sellers to, 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 to say, I'm not going to sell. Yeah. Where am I going to go? Where And then where am I going to go happens? Because look, hey, uh, I need to buy a house. Marcus has the house that I need to buy. Rob has the house Marcus needs to buy. And Rob is not putting his house in the market. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so now <laughs> that just log jams the whole thing. <laughs> that just log jams the whole thing. And so at some point, Rob's going to feel comfortable to put his home on the market. Marcus is going to say, now my house is available. I can put mine on the market. I then the first time home buyer are going to say, finally, I can get a house without competing with someone who's willing to pay 20,000 over this price for cash because I am a first time home buyer and I don't have that opportunity. You know, now we can create the opportunity for our buyers with certain programs and tools and resources. And you got to know that have that in your toolbox. Okay. We're having to create creative solutions for the challenges today. And you have got to have not only knowledge on what's going on in the marketplace, but a full toolbox to bring to the situation. And so, uh, so that's just, that's part of that. Uh, look, this is uh, the predictions for the number of transactions in, uh, in 2021. You can see 2021 predictions, 7.6.7, uh, 7.5 7 and 7.1. So transaction forecast is high six is low seven million transactions. And chief economist says we'd be on an 8 million unit pace if we were to, uh, to have more inventory. Now, difference is you'll hear a lot of information out there on the wire that's national news, national numbers, national statistics. Important, let's look at the national statistics because that gives an overview. And we've got to have our own local statistics because our market right here in, in my backyard right here is, is different than the rest of the country. But it's important for you to understand both and why they're different. So let's dig in just a little bit. Hey, Jason, can you yes. go back to that slide real quick? So the 6.775, 7, so that's still up by over 2 million um, transactions from last year, right? This is a pace we were on. Okay, so transaction forecast for 2020 was this. We, I think we ended in somewhere like 5.9. 5, okay. But so we were two. on over 6 million unit pace. And so a lot of what you, you'll hear, like when the chief economist says an 8 million unit pace, 
That is an annually, like seasonally adjusted number that's, that's for the year. Right. We had a slowdown, brief, then a speed up, and we continue to accelerate the pace of sales all the way through the end of the year. Right. And at the end of the year, we were at a six something million unit pace. Got it. And then uh, Yun is saying we would be on an eight million unit pace if we had inventory, did not have the headwinds of the inventory. Got it. So the predictions are 6.5, 6. You know, 7, 7, 1, whatever. Right. But the pace is a little The heavy. pace is an important thing to note Got because it. that's that's like the velocity at which we're moving right now. Got it. And so it accelerated. So you can't just take last year and say 5.9 or whatever. You got to say well, we ended the year at a pace, pace that was well. breakneck. Got and it. now we demand is, is still a breakneck pace. Pace so home price uh, prediction is 5.9% uh, for this year in, in all of the U.S. So, so the U.S. national numbers, and you can see they're super smart people that have a lot of different opinions. These are all opinions from very smart economic people who crunch numbers and they're super geeky nerds. And this is where they come up with all of the numbers. And you can see there's a lot of them are in this, this range right here. Uh, you know, this one right here is higher, but the average is 5.9%. Increase in price, 5.9% increase in price. So let's look at Metro Atlanta. So national year-over-year -year increase, home sales was 7%. Uh, Atlanta year-over-year -year increase in home sales, 36 This is the prediction. Here's what I want you to see. The national prediction is higher than the local prediction for year-over-year -year sales. What's one of the reasons why that might be? Price point uh, it is, so think about what I said about Georgia continuing to be open. So, so they have a lot of pent up. They the have a lot country, of rocks. The, the country has, has a, lot a lot of rocks. Of rocks. Yes. Yeah. The country has a lot of rocks. Yes. Atlanta, we continue. Yeah. So, so because we had such a, a, a strong pace in Georgia in 2020, we did not have as much pent up demand. When you look at some other areas of the country where real estate was forbidden. Yeah, Michigan, not, it's a lot yes, of states yes, that, even show that you can't even show. You go to, straight to jail, you just do yeah. like that. I didn't even, I didn't even show you all my straight to jail thing, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's my favorite TikTok right now, I don't know. So, but so <laughs> here's the deal, uh, yes, those areas are were significantly depressed in transaction units. And as those free up, they will come back a lot, but we were still open. So our, our increase in unit volume is going to be because of release of inventory. Okay, not because we were totally shut down and now we're open. So then national year over year increase in home price 5.7, Atlanta Metro 6.2, so robust economy. We're inviting a lot of companies in right now. If you read anywhere, Atlanta Business Chronicle, Wall Street Journal, any of those where you're seeing the amount of commerce coming into Georgia right now, it's huge. And so that's it's great. You live in one of the best major metropolitan areas to live in in the entire country for affordability and business and transportation and, all, and climate and all of those things. So talent, 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 pool. talent pool. Yeah, entertainment yes. now. All the things we used to yes. talk about probably eight years ago, we're seeing it now. Yes. We remember we used to talk about the Savannah Port being dressed, the Army Corps of Engineers opening that up to bigger barges. So now that attract those Fortune 50 companies yes. because their commerce can get in and yes. got the world busiest airport is yes. still expanding. Thank you. Um, you know, we got talent, Georgia Tech, AU Center, Keep going. Georgia, Terrell, all Reach. these different Let's things go. here. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Um, and then you add the movie industry yeah. and the Boom. entertainment. You got a world-class city. And then you add Magic City. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I got on the mouth track. No, no. Yeah. So, so. Oh, God. I'm sorry, man. All right. So, you've been on your clientele. You've got your clientele. You got to act. Hey, Terrell, I take the meeting back. Now. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I have the control. So, it's like when you're flying with, a, with, an, with, with an instructor, you know, he's like, okay, uh, you have the plane. And then the person says, I have the plane. And it's clear you communication about who's flying. Okay, you know? And then the instructor <laughs> you have says, the plane, James. okay, you have the plane. Then I say, I have the plane. I don't mind giving you the controls, but 
Well, on that one, I got to bring it back. <laughs> so here's the thing. You just have to know. I, I love this book. You just have to know. You have to know why those some of those things are. And you've got to be able to tell that story when you're talking to people about, uh, because look, we're getting a lot of relocation traffic right now. And y'all better be able to tell that story and the reasons why. Because people are going to be considering multiple cities and multiple jobs. The job market is a fuego right now. And people are transferring, and so you just have to know that. Okay, so uh, let's hit a couple of these. This is the the uh, something with Gary shared in the uh, <clears throat> in in the uh, Vision Speaks revisited. This is a four percent trend line, four percent over a long period of time, four percent annual appreciation. All right. So back to eighty nine, and then you can see an O oh, two thousand one. It peaked above that four percent trend line. It's like, okay, what's going on there? You know, demand was high, whatever. Then it it rode over that four percent trend line for one, two, three, four, five, six years before two thousand six happened. So it rode above the trend line for six years before two thousand six happened, and then we had the correction or the Great Recession or whatever you choose to call that in your own home. So. Last year, we had 10.8, 10% appreciation or median price increase. And, and so these are, these are big numbers. That's not 4%, that's much greater than 4%. And, um, and then the price, uh, like I said, the price appreciation forecast is 5.9%. So that's when you get to, and I've got these things in here where it's like, what are you gonna do about it? And we're gonna, and I'm gonna move through so you get everything. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what are you gonna do with that information? So. You have all that information. What do you do about it? What we just talked about. Share it. Share it. This is that's an easy one. This is a very easy answer to the question. Is number one, you have to study it and know it to where you can then share it. And you got to you got to create these little sound bites. Look, I'm I'm on my so my son plays baseball. It's his last year. He's a senior in high school. He's not going to play at the next level. And uh, this is this is it. So for eight, eight, nine years, we've been ten years. We've been on the on the bleachers. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had on the bleachers about real estate. So wherever your bleachers are, then you're having these conversations about real estate. You've got to be able to tell that story. And so they're going to ask you, "Hey, what do you do? What do you do?" Okay, oh, you are a real estate market. Oh my goodness, you know, oh, I heard such and such. And then you've got to be able to put that down. So know it. Put it into to, to digestible sound bites that you can have that conversation. And then inevitably, a conversation is going to come up right now is, is this time like that time? Okay, that's I'm I'm having this conversation so often right now. People are like, is it gonna crash? This feels very, very much like 2005. Like I remember the prices going up so much. I remember when we had this situation or that situation, and then we have PTSD around that, because then I remember the pain that I suffered for years after that. And so why is this time not like last time? I'll give you some talking points on this and some real information. This is appreciation leading up, the years leading up to the crash. And I told you 4% was that like that, that trend line, 8.5, 8.7, 12.5, 11.4, up to 2005 and then 2006 happened and flattened a little bit and then we went off a cliff and for the first time in decades real estate devalued real estate almost never devalues it's an appreciating now look appreciation will slow you be one percent two percent ten percent four percent very rarely negative does it devalue real estate devalued okay but we had this massive run up. I, show, I showed you six years above the trend line of 4%. Long time. We, we, we could have seen that come. This is the years leading up to 2020. 6.4, 4.8, 4.7, boom, 9.2. It really was 10 point something when they crunched all of the numbers. But you get the picture, 10%. That's a big number. 10% is a big number. Well, you can see that this time is totally different than last time. 6.3 average versus 10.3% average above the line. And this is one year with that kind of super high year-over-year uh, -year appreciation. And we can completely explain why the 10% exists. Why does 10% exist? Because we have- Because of Rob. 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 Yes, Rob's exactly. fault. Rob, sell your house, Rob. <sighs> so 
robbed in his house. So you see the situation and, and, and what caused that incredible demand. Because look, simple economics is when you have a lot of people going for this one item, there's very few of those items. It always creates pricing support for the item that's being sold. Always, it always will. Always will. So we've got this appreciation. Here's the next thing um, that's different is month supply of inventory, the actual inventory. In 2006, we had eight months supply of inventory. So eight months supply of inventory leading into the Great Recession. All right. So when you look at this, it's been over 10 years. It's been 10 years since we have been in a balanced or a uh, seller, a, a buyer's market. Most people that I'm in front of a room weren't even in the, like you've never seen a, a buyer's market because it's been 10 years since we've been at that six months or higher inventory. Okay. Jason. We don't have to go down this road, but I have a quick question about that. Sure. So, so see how we're in the red there, and over the over the years, I've heard that the crash wasn't really caused by us; it was caused by Wall Street. Yes. Because of all the one hundred percent the programs and putting people in bad loans and bad paper, right? So the houses was always for sale, and and they I'm, had a lot. I'll tell you the Here's the difference. When that inventory was running up, we had speculative buying all over the place. Yeah. Here's what speculative buying is. I have no intention of, of, of moving into that house. Right. But that house is appreciating at 10%, at 1% per month. You get a $250,000 house that's appreciating at $2,500 per month. And you control that house for a few months while it's under contract. And then you never occupy it. You flip and turn and sell it. And you make yourself $15,000, $20,000. That was happening all over the place. People were controlling a property, never occupying it, never closing a loan on it, selling the right to buy it. And the price was just running up because all these speculative buyers running in, trying to get that equity run up. That is not sustainable. What we have today is we've got owner-occupied people buying houses to live in. And, and then we had speculative buying all over the place. New construction, I remember new construction, there were, they would have new uh, old, like um, pre-sale events where they would put a date out and people would camp out in RVs for days and days, like they were getting a new iPhone or something, okay? They would camp out for days just to get their five minutes in the seat in the sales office. And the sales agent said something like this, You've got five minutes to make a full price offer on whatever is left. If you're not going to make full price, you need to vacate the seat because the next person will. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. I remember that. And, and even though we had higher inventory right here leading into that six, seven months of five inventory, the inventory was getting gobbled up. Remember, we were, on, we were doing 7.5 million units at that point in time. It was just the velocity was crazy breakneck speed. And the builders were putting product on the ground like crazy, and you got to feed that machine. If you're putting a, a house on the ground today, you had to have started feeding that machine two years before that. And 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 then it was a race. It was just crazy. Yes, interest rate. I mean, uh, mortgages. And so, and we're going to talk about that difference too. But here's the deal. Right now, I'm going to I'm going to tell you what your month supply of inventory is in our backyard right here. 0. 0.8 months. 0. 0.8 month supply of inventory and heading into the crash, not only was appreciation off the chain for six years prior to the crash, we had seven, eight months supply of inventory and now we have less than one. That's totally different. So here's another difference is now Americans have so much equity, 60%, uh, uh, so about 60% of homeowners have over 60% equity. That's a huge number. You don't think about that when you're dealing, when you're working with a lot of buyers that are getting 5% down or 15, 20% down loans. But 80, what, 84 million uh, people in the US is 7 million transactions. So 84 million homeowners, those 84 million homeowners have had the benefit of the run up of equity since they've lived in the house. And so the price has gone up. 
and uh, and people are, are have 60 percent equity and 42 percent of all homeowners own their home free wow. the amount of equity that lives in homes today is completely different than what lived in homes in 2006 and 17. totally different here's another thing uh the equity that they did have the underwriting uh rules were so loose <laughs> That they were cashing out. They were doing 105, 101, 110, 100% refi, cash out refis. And they were doing them on no uh, documentation, no uh, credit. No, it's like, I just sign on a piece of paper. How much money do I need to make to, to get that mortgage? Oh, you need to make 100,000. I make 100,000. <laughs> Well, how do we know that? Because if, if you do, you need to sign this piece of paper. I will sign a piece of paper. I'm making this thousand dollars. That is how the loan process went. That's exactly how it went. And so, so you had people cashing out in the years leading up to the Great Recession. Eight hundred and twenty-four billion dollars was cashed out in cash out refis in properties. And the the years leading up to 2020, only two hundred and thirty-two billion. And and you didn't, you don't have the 100% cash out refi, and we're at 60% of homeowners have 60% equity. So even if this money that was cashed out, it wasn't cashed out at a point where it put the, the homeowner in jeopardy uh, and razor thin margins where they could possibly lose the home because we've got what the next slide says is very sound underwriting uh, processes and requirements in today's market. So leading up to the crash, prior to the crack, the bubble, this is a, a mortgage credit availability index. So this is kind of like, how easy is it to get a loan? How easy is it to get a loan? Or how difficult is it to get a loan? So in the 2006, prior to the bubble, it had increased to eight, an index of 868 points. Today it's 124. Simply means, we're not doing crazy loans right now. We're not doing those crazy programs. They've got sound underwriting processes. So the person who's getting a loan, they, 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 it's, it, they should be getting a loan. Not back then where we are giving loans when we shouldn't be giving loans. And yes, Terrell, that, this led us into, uh, because in, in a nutshell, in two sentences or so, you know, they took the, all of those loans, they packaged them together and they sold them and securitized them and sold them on Wall Street. And so, but they hid all of the crappy loans in with some good ones and said, here's a package of A paper. And they rated the A paper very high and people spent, the, they, were, they were wanting to deploy money to make money a lot during that time. And so those, those got securitized and traded. And then there were some defaults in there. And when the defaults happened, then all of a sudden they like opened the package up and they said, what's in here really? Yeah. And when they saw what was really in there, it was, it was a lot of not a loans. They were a lot of subprime loans with very high default rates. And then it caused a, oh man, we got to get rid of this before all of them default. So fire sell that now. Then you have the, the opposite of, uh, in, in economics where you have a lot of sellers and no buyers. It's like, well, we'll sell it for less. We'll sell it for less. I'll discount that. I'll discount this. And that created, that created a fall. Then the foreclosure market, because, because we, we did have this, right. which created that. So totally different, totally, totally different. And last thing on this, you know, is, are we crashy thing is this right here, which is, uh, the four percent trend line. You see, we trend six years above that four percent, and then we devalued, and we've been systematically chasing that line for uh, over a decade here, or about a decade. And look, we had high appreciation in this one year, 2020. This all was very normal, high appreciation right there, and we can explain it now. What is what happens in 2021? Is it going to be 5.9? You could probably explain that with two. Then what happens in 2022? Is it four, four and a half, three and a half, whatever? Those are the things you need to look at to say, are we going, are we heading in a direction where we might be in trouble? And the answer right now is no, because of all of those reasons. So my question to you is, can you put that into a paragraph when 
you're on the bleachers with somebody and they're like, oh man, it feels super crashy. I'm getting nervous. I don't know what's going on. I remember 2006, seven, I lost my house, lost my family, lost my cars, you know, lost my best friend. All those, and you're like, hey, this sounds not like last time. This sounds not like, look, we went into the, the crash of 2008 with tons of inventory, speculative buyers like crazy. We had razor thin equity in houses. People were using their houses, ATMs. There were $800 billion taken out in the years leading up to the crash by homeowners doing these refis. The credit, the way that they were doing mortgages to people who really shouldn't be getting mortgages, high default rate was crazy. It's totally different than it is right now. There was seven months of five inventory then, now we have less than one. The demand is crazy. Now is totally not the same as it was then. I mean, you gotta be able to put something behind it because that's a different conversation than someone says, oh man, it feels like it's gonna crash. And you go, no, it's not. <laughs> Well, it feels like it's going to, it's not. <laughs> okay, yes, I will trust you with my $300,000, you know, life savings in my house where I raised my family because, you know, that's a four-year-old conversation. No, it's not. <laughs> where this is, a, this is a grown folks conversation right here where you're giving real information on why it's different. So I want you to have that. The This time is not like last time. No crash ahead. We're not like hurling down a road and we just blew through the sign that says bridge out. That's not what's going on right now. So what do you do about that? Share. <laughs> That's an easy answer to all of these questions. Yes, share. You got a game plan around it uh, as far as your business goes. But what do you want to do with it? Well, I have a question and I, maybe I can answer that question. Sure. So when it comes down to the increase uh, at 5.9 this year, um, or last year, do we see that increase? Do you predict that increase to happen at 5.9 or higher this year coming or the next few years? Because I'm asking for an investor, the investor mindset, right? Sure. So they want to buy a property, run a property over the next three to five years. They want to see what that does. Does what do you know if it slows due to interest rates rising? We're still chasing this line. Okay. We still have high demand. We still have low interest rates. We still have low inventory. All of those circumstances and low interest, all of those circumstances create strong appreciation. Until that changes dramatically, look, there are a couple of things that might change that. And one of the things, and um, uh, I'll get to it in a minute, but one of the things is people think that there's this big foreclosure thing gonna happen because of forbearances. Right. It's not, right. and I'm gonna prove it to you in a minute, but I'll give you the four-year-old answer. It's not, <laughs> okay. and then I'll prove it to you with some, with some real stuff. Um, that's not going to provide inventory. We have builders that are rushing to put product on the ground and they're having massive issues with supply chain, uh, labor, cost of things. Yeah, you know, lumber is a commodity, it's tripled. You know, I mean, the, all of these things are, are, are major headwinds for the construction industry. And I do believe that over the next 18 months, we see uh, some certainty come back in the marketplace. We see all clear, all clear on coronavirus. I mean, it's just like, Hey, it's very flu-like now. We've got this vaccine. We know how to treat it. The death rate has plummeted. It's not like, look, it's going to be very much like the flu, probably, where we have a seasonal thing, and and but it's not going to be, you know, millions of people dying. Of. So you've got that. You've got people feeling comfortable. You've got builders putting product on the ground, and then you have a potential increase in interest rate. Even a marginal increase in interest rate will cool things down just a little. Bit. So all of those things hopefully creates a higher inventory because 0.8 months supply of inventory is crushing. It's not fun. It's not fun. Now it's great if you're controlling a few properties and getting a 10% run up. That's great. Not sustainable. So I think it cools off. I think we have strong appreciation. I think Atlanta Metro, we have strong appreciation and, uh, and barring something unforeseen. And, and look, one of the potential unforeseen is a big change in the tax code. So uh, if all of a sudden in the new tax bill, there's a massive difference in capital gains tax to your point with your investor, if you have investors who have any intention of in liquidating a portfolio in the next five years, well, if there's a 10% increase in capital gains tax, then what does that do to the investor that's looking to liquidate? They've got to recapture gains in those properties. So let's say somebody's got a I don't know, like a $2 million portfolio. They're saying, I'm, I'm 70 years old, I'm whatever, 
I'm looking to liquidate this portfolio, move it into something else, create this estate plan, blah, blah, blah. Or I'm 40 and I'm ready to retire and liquidate some stuff. Okay, that $2 million, if the capital gains tax, if, if there is a bill that changes, there's two main investor things on the table, 1031 like, like kind of exchange, and that is a mechanism to, to roll gains into another type of same like kind investment, which investors will sell homes, roll those gains into another home and not have to recapture that gain, but they still, they still own it. The gain's still there. Capital gains is I'm selling something, and if it's if it's taxed at my regular, you know, income rate, whatever, it, it, that's one thing. But if they change that, and they make and and the and the new tax law makes that ten percent higher, which is a conservative number for what the expectation is. Well, ten percent additional gains on two million dollars. How much is that? That could end up being over two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah. I, would put, I want to put a number to that. That's $200,000 in additional taxes right. that a person would pay if they liquidate that portfolio. That will create a rush to anyone who's expected to and be in touch with your investors and know what's going on with the tax code, how that will impact your folks. If, if the government puts a date out there and says, on this day, we're going we're gonna to change that tax then there's going to be a massive amount of activity in the investor world to liquidate portfolios of anyone who plans on liquidating it in the next five to 10 years, when there likely could be another change in tax code. So you just got to be aware of that. <clears throat> and that's important. That's way more important to your investor than, than this run-up right now. If uh, anybody who's looking to liquidate. Like I'm an investor. I'm not looking to liquidate. I'm, I, I continue to buy. And I don't care if they change the tax code because I'm not selling. I'm not selling. It's okay. But anybody who's got their portfolio and they're looking to liquidate, and there's a 10% hike on capital gains rate, that matters right. a lot. Yeah. yeah. So I do think that the part that it goes up. I do think we continue to have strong appreciation. Our appreciation is fundamentals. There are buyers looking to occupy a house, wanting to buy strong fundamentals in the Atlanta metro area, and the market is not inflated by speculative buyers. It's not inflated by buyers who shouldn't be getting mortgages on homes. I think it's good. I don't think it's 10% anymore. I hope not. Okay. All right. So we're going to blow through this bit right here. The coronavirus stuff, uh, you know that you hear and see the stuff. Like, look, the cases have gone down dramatically off the peak. They've gone down. One of the things you might hear is, uh, oh, uh, because look, the media, the media is, what, what is the only sole purpose in the media's life? Get more views. So you're intimidating, scary, scary. Listen to me really, really clearly. One reason and one reason only for every media outlet to exist to sell advertising. It's a for profit business. They sell advertising. The way they sell advertising is viewership. A lot of times, the way they sell viewership is sensationalism. On, I don't care what kind of. In, feedback loop you find yourself in. I don't care what side of any aisles or arguments or decisions or preferences you fall on. There's a media outlet that's going to feed into your dogma and get you in a feedback loop. And then you're going to be watching and clicking and reading and they're selling advertise on your back. Okay. So they're just looking to sell advertising. Be eyes wide open and look for the information that matters. So a lot of the stories right now is 21 uh, states have an increase in coronavirus. It's like, well, what is Georgia? And what are those 21? And what is the increase? Is the increase like it was 30 in the state and now it's 31? Or is it like it's 30 and now it's 60? Because those are two totally different scenarios. So you've got to be really aware of, of what's going on in our, in our state and also what's going on nationally. <coughs> And primarily, you see in two, two, state, two types of states, rural areas where it's still kind of finding its way through the rural areas, and other one is states that were, have been extremely, extremely locked down, and then there is some release in that. There's some new cases, but the great thing is that even in the states where there's an increase in cases, there's still decrease in deaths because we've gotten a great handle on how to treat, and the vaccine is widely now getting out. And, you know, in the state of Georgia, anybody over, I think, 16 would get. So, you know, those numbers are going down. The death rate is going down. This is Georgia. Georgia is just continuing to plummet. 
you know, we were open. We did the safe thing. We had the spike, just like everybody else. You had the spike. It's going down. It continues to go down. The death rate has continued to go down. And the percent positive, so this is like, hey, 100 tests are given. How many of the 100 people that took a test are positive? And you can see in this time, it was like 25%, 15%, 20%, and we're now down to 5.67%, which anything over seven is it's under control based on the CDC's guidelines. So that's, we're in a good spot. We're in a good spot. Stay safe, do the right thing, all of those things, get your bags. However you're, you know, whatever your um, perspective is on that, do it. But you got to know the numbers. Hospitalization down, capacity still great. I mean, this is not an issue right now as it relates to, you know, like this is something you need to pay attention to, but the numbers are trending drastically down nationally and locally. Okay, so the economy, I got to, oh man, am I already at this? Is it already? Yeah, you guys, I mean, I think this is good enough to we can run over just a little bit. I'm going to blow if through. If you have to go, yeah, here, here's it good. is being recorded and we can put it up on the If Facebook you, you got to go, I totally am not offended. I completely understand. I, I respect your time just as much as you respect mine. So if you got to go, I totally understand. No problem. I'm going to keep blowing through this. I'm going to move a little faster over the next little bit, but I do have a few more things I want to share with you. Uh, economic news, 6.2% uh, unemployment right now. Look, it did spike to 15. That's a sensational headline. Let me tell you, this is the soundbite I want you to hear. When we, as, a, as the United States of America and the federal government says we're shutting everything down and we're going to incentivize you to put your people on unemployment by giving a subsidy of $600 per week, not $300 per week, this was by design. It was by design to put people home without harm significantly harming them. And that is that is the motivation behind that. It spiked to 15% by design. Then it plummeted back down by design. The play worked. The government made a play. The play worked. It spiked. It went down. It worked. So a lot of sensationalism around that unemployment rate, but... The plan worked. Here's the deal. If you look back at previous recessions, the Great Depression, over 9% unemployment for 108 months. The Great Recession, 2009, you know, 10, 11, 30 months over 9%. The 1980s oil recession, 19 months over 9%. And the 2020 recession, four months over 9%. It was by design, quickly, quickly. We're going to get there. We're going to pay a subsidy so people aren't significantly harmed by design. Some were. I'm not discounting the fact that some people were harmed by. And by and large, with that with that stimulus and with with the subsidy, and then we're right back. So, state of Georgia, 5.6. Those are not scary unemployment numbers, folks. Those are not scary unemployment numbers. And you see help wanted signs all over the place. All right, I want to get into some numbers here in your marketplace. This is this is by the way. Uh, th this is these are the zip codes I pulled. So right here in our backyard, um, uh, somewhere on the bottom of the slide there, you can't see it are the zip codes. So if you look at the slide, you can know where the information is coming from. But median sold price in the last year up twenty six percent. That's ridiculous. That's a crazy number. That's a crazy number. So to your investor friends. Um, look, this is a great place to have bought a year ago and, and look at your numbers to make sure they continue to trend that way to see if you buy something, you're going to be appreciating that amount. That's not sustainable. It won't stay like that forever, but that's a huge number. Price per square foot up 18.6. Sometimes I look at median sales price and I say, well, that just means the lower, the bottom end of the market got absorbed and now we're selling higher priced houses. But then I look at price per square foot because that's kind of a little bit more of a appreciation type number, 18%. So still great. Homes for sale down 52%. That's that that's a crushing number. Like how many homes for sale, you know, the difference down 52% and solds up 4%. So solds have stayed strong. Uh, homes for sale have gone down. We've absorbed the market and new listings down 29%. So you see how that's all playing. Um, canceled expired down 65%. So, you know, like in the in all of those zip codes, 20 for 20 canceled expires last month. That's you're not gonna gonna like you're not gonna make a million on expired right. 
may be a great part of your strategy, maybe a leg on your stool. I, I like it. And just no market at the moment. That's not going to be one right now. MSI, month supply of inventory, 0.8 month supply of inventory. I changed the name of this. It's no longer month supply of inventory, it's minutes supply of inventory. <laughs> so MSI does not mean uh, month supply of inventory anymore. And then the last thing here is 99.9% list to sell price. And that's gone up 6%. 99.9% list to sell price. That's a crazy number. Crazy number. That clock fooled me, man. Yeah. Yeah, take that down. So, so I appreciate y'all staying with me, but I blame Terrell. Yeah. <laughs> or blame Rob for the housing price. Right, so, so blame Terrell for keeping time. 10 minutes. Yeah. All right, so what are you going to do about that? You're going to know those numbers. You're going to be able to tell the story. You're going to be able to help to inform your clients on what they need to know to make a good informed decision on their real estate needs. Don't do this. I've already told you this. The reason why people didn't put their house in the market in 2020, you see that financial uncertainty, life is too uncertain, and COVID-19 concern. That's going to release itself over the next 12 months and resolve. That's going to resolve. And you see, they'll start putting their homes on the market once they feel a little more comfortable, get the vaccine, that kind of thing. It's going to be, uh, those people are going to come off the sidelines and into the game to take advantage of the massive increase, 26% in this area. I mean, you've got to be telling the story. And I want to just for one second go back to what do you do about that? What do you do about that on that equity run up, that price increase? Is I promise you right now, <coughs> there are, there are, homeowners in your target market and in your database have no clue how much they can sell their house for right now. No clue. I'm going to give you a script that we're using our team right now that's working beautifully. And it's when we're circle prospecting a neighborhood around for a buyer, around a listing or in our database. The question is like this. Hey, Terrell, this is Jason Kelly. Really just wondering at what price would you be willing to sell your house for? So I'm not saying... Hey, my name is Jason. I was wondering if you were looking to buy or sell or invest in real estate now or in the near future. Oh, thank you for thinking about that. Do you know of anyone that does? I thank you for your thinking about that, by the way. If, you know, like I'm not doing that. And they say, no, 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 thank you. Goodbye. This is a thought provoking question. Hey, at what price would you sell your house? Because then they're like, I don't know. I mean, 300? You're like, I'll be over there tonight. <laughs> Look, we, we sold a, a house just like we've got listings like this. We've sold houses like this. This is a money script I'm giving to you right now. We had a buyer in an area. This person was going to put their house on the market as a rental. They got relocated uh, to, to Miami. And, uh, and so they were going to put their house on the rental market. And Nikki called the person up and said, hey, I see you're going to rent your house. At what price would you sell it for? And they said, they said we can't sell it. We can't, get, we can't get what we need out of it to be able to sell it. So we're just going to rent it. Well, at what price would you be willing to sell the house? They said 370. She said, can I show that house tonight? I said, absolutely you can. That night that house was under contract at 380. Yeah. Okay. So that's just, I'm telling you, this is, that is a great, right? That is a great question to ask your database. And I want you to, to, to lean into that. Okay. So new homes, that's going to be another way we're going to get Houses on the market. This is national numbers. We crossed a million new starts last year for the first time since before the Great Recession. And then this is Atlanta. So I told you there's national numbers, and then you've got to know your local numbers. These are permits. You can see the Great Recession, and then we began to come back, and we've got a significant increase in 2020, 21, uh, because builders are rushing to put inventory in the ground to meet this massive demand. Okay, so you say, what about the big forbearance thing? So about 2.9 million forbearances, something like that, okay? So if 84 million homeowners, 6 million transactions per year, 2.9 million uh, people are, are in active forbearance. This is the where they stood as of February 14th, 2021. 51% have worked out their forbearance already. Either A, they, they applied for it, got approved, and never missed a payment. They were like, hey, I'm probably going to need this because it's scary. They got approved. And they're like, whoa, this isn't scary. I'm going to keep making my payment. All right, that was 27. 7.5 of the loan paid off. They didn't have a rich uncle that died. They sold the house. Okay, that's how they paid that mortgage off. 15.4% past past due payments were brought current. They worked it out. I didn't make my payment a couple of months. It's not that scary. I'm making my payment. I caught it up. I'm good. 25% are in a loan deferral. So now 
That's just the uh, deferred out. 7.8 in a, a full modification, about 15% of those deferrals, deferments have now, have, are still not worked out. So uh, DS News here says about 325,000 uh, units may come on the market in the next six to nine months. I don't agree with that. I think it's the next 12 to 18 months that that, that, that will disperse. And when you look at six plus million units per year in, in the whole country, and you take 325 units and you sprinkle them out over the whole country over a year, it's a non-event. This is not, it's not a football We're going through the garden hose that's gonna you know, get you and devalue and all that kind of stuff. In fact, this is the number of homes on the market in January of each year. And you can see 900,087, 800, 722 in January, 2020. January 21, 325,000 properties on the market. If you took all 325,000 forbearances and you just dumped them on the market right then, it still wouldn't equal January's numbers last year. And we've got a higher demand this year than we did last year. That would be absorbed like that. So the foreclosure thing, not going to be an issue. It's not a big, it's any kind of a big scary thing. So, all right, what do you do with that? With the foreclosure thing is you've got to be able to tell the story. You probably have some investors like, oh, I'm, I'm waiting for the foreclosure because of forbearance and all those kind of things. Mm. You know, okay, chomping it like I'm, you know, salivating because I want those forbearances because they're all going to be foreclosures. Not going to happen. Will you find a couple? Sure. Are there people who more work out? Yes. Are there mortgage uh, servicers who will discount one or two houses? Yes. Those deals will be out there somewhere, but it's not going to be flooding the market and all of a sudden we're going to have a foreclosure market. Uh, in the, there, there was a time, and I, I had to time hop on my Facebook. It's like, hey, great news. Uh, distressed property is now under 35% of the market. I was laughing. Oh. Distressed property is less than 1% of our market right now, and it's not projected to increase right. because of the sound underwriting things they're talking about, because of the equity that everybody has, because of the fact that if someone wants to sell their house, they got in trouble, they have equity. They're going to sell it on the open market retail or higher cash out and go down the road and still be in trouble, but they're not going to fire sell their house because they don't have to. You cannot, you almost cannot underprice a house in today's market. I could not physically go and take a $300,000, $200,000 house, underprice it and undersell it in the open market. I could go to you and say, would you like to buy my house for less than it's worth? And you would say, I totally would like to do that. And if I don't, I know someone who will that I can't put a house on the open market right now and underprice it because the market will bid it up, okay? So look, that's what I got for y'all today. Here's my thing is y'all have to be the economist of choice. You've got to have a handle on this, these, these numbers, the conditions in your marketplace nationally, locally. You got to bring them down into little sound bites that you can talk about on the bleachers, people sitting next to you at the club or the bar, or, you know, like you've got to be able to have those conversations. That's your database, your circle prospecting, know your scripts and dialogues, Give people the information that they need to make an informed decision in this marketplace and be their consultant, right? It's going to be tough sled. 0.8 months of five inventory and 25 offers on every property is tough sled. And y'all need to have masterminds in this place about how do you win the deal? How do you find the listings? How do you win the deal? And, and then you use this information to, uh, to be the economist of choice on that spot in people's mind. That's all I got. Yeah. Hey, thank you, man. Right. Guys, one thing on that foreclosure, because I've been seeing this lately, there's companies out here that's selling you programs on foreclosures are coming, get ready, and charging you $399 to learn how to get these foreclosures that's coming. Well, you're educated, right? You're educated and know that that's just someone selling a program for something that's probably never going to happen. So... Thank you, Jason. Um, I really appreciate you, man. And thank you guys for sticking out. I know we went about 10 minutes over. Um, that's my fault. Use well, thank command you. and stay in front of those people. You see what's coming. Use command and stay in front of them so they think about you when it's time. Well, you know that's your uh, Morgan Center Tech training talking to you right there. <laughs> command, command, command. But thank you guys so much for all we went over. This will be available on our private Facebook group um, here shortly today. And I appreciate you guys. See you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thank